So I'm Caroline Austin and I'm the, the chairperson of the Northern Region of RSB and Roz, Roz is our secretary. And we have three speakers today and we have Harriet from RSB HQ sort of helping with the technical side of things. So, so the three speakers today, we've got Katrina Manville, Dr. Katrina, Katrina Manville, who now works at the Academy of Medical Research Charities. We've got Dr. Lillian Hunt, that work, who works at EDIS, which is housed at Wellcome. And we've got Dr. Jade Hall, who works at the Royal Society of Biology. So, so we're incredibly lucky to have these three, three amazing speakers here to tell us a, a little bit about science policy, but also about their career routes into science policy. And the reason I thought it would be a good idea to have a session on this is because Katrina, many moons ago, was a PhD student in my lab, and then she moved into science policy after doing an internship at the British Library. And what Katrina commented on sort of was that actually when you're doing a degree and a PhD, nobody had ever mentioned the fact that there were even careers in science policy. It wasn't even a thing. You didn't hear about it in Newcastle. So um, we thought it would actually be good to have a session about, about this exciting career path that people can follow. So I'm going to hand over to Katrina and um, let Katrina tell you a little bit about her career path rather than telling you all about it myself. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. And thank you, Caroline, for inviting me to talk with you guys today. It's something I'm really passionate about because I think that there are so many different types of careers um, and I kind of always wish I'd known more. So I started thinking about when I was putting this together about sort of how did I get here? Obviously, without causing an existential crisis on a Thursday evening, um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about it. So where have I come from? Um, I studied in Newcastle, as Caroline said, and I think a lot of it was sort of very serendipitous. So I went into Newcastle University to study biochemistry because I liked biology and chemistry and it combined these. Okay, these are probably not things I should be telling my former PhD supervisor, but you know, this is how the decisions took place. So I ended up working for Caroline um, on a BBSRC uh, funded studentship. And in the middle picture there, you've got the uh, GSK site at Ware. <clears throat> and I was there for just over a year of my PhD. So I had great exposure to both what it was like in an academic lab, but also what it was like in industry. And as I got to the end, I think both Caroline and I knew that I wasn't gonna stay in academia, but the question was, what should I do? And so I took a student, um, a placement at the British Library working in science policy. And I, I wouldn't say when I got to the end of it, I knew that definitely science policy was the space for me. But what I did know was that academic, academia probably wasn't. And I don't know if this will resonate with people, but the reason I knew it wasn't right was because when you go for that postdoc interview and you're asked, what would the £250,000 project that you would do if you could spend that money on anything? I didn't know the answer to it. All I could think was, I could travel around the world for that money. And I didn't have that spark. I didn't have that question, that burn that I wanted to do. So, <clears throat> sorry, I thought to myself, you know, I'll go to the British Library and I'll try it out. And I did a placement there linked with the Royal Society of Biology. And I was able to set up an event in all about the REF and about the introduction of the impact element, as it was at the time. And I really enjoyed writing the policy paper, bringing the people together, stimulating the debate. But there was still something missing around it. And I realised it was because although I enjoyed talking and I enjoyed the communicating side, I didn't want to be a science communicator. I still wanted to get into the evidence and do part of the research. So, you know, at the end of the day, I had the traditional career options. I could become a lawyer with my PhD. I could become a doctor, a banker or a scientist. 
So, you know, we've already established that I've decided long term I'm probably not going to be a scientist. I thought I'll do an MSc. And my parents just said, no, go and get a real job. So I had to find something to do. And what it led me to do was whilst I was at the British Library, I was trying to find uh, some speakers to talk about impact. And I found out about this organisation, a uh, sort of think tank called RAND. And uh, they had a job advert that just said, is interested in science. And I thought, yeah, that's me. So probably contrary to what many people would have done with that, I applied for the job and ended up working uh, in a policy think tank. Um, and whilst I was there, I was also seconded to the Department of Health for a couple of years. That's the middle picture. Um, and then the final one is, and whilst I was there, I also uh, had my two children um, and the cat. So, you know, when I moved to Rand, it was um, basically, it's headquartered in the US, but there's about 90 researchers in the UK. And people just said, you know, it's perfect for you. But what it did for me was that it broadened my skills into sort of social science side of things. So as well as being able to pipette and run the experiments and all of that on the lab side, uh, I broadened into interviews, literature reviews, focus groups and surveys. And I worked on a broad range of topics. So here on this slide are some of the different types of things that I worked on whilst I was at RAND. And what happens is that a lot of the work that they do is commission based. So there'll be a number of tenders that come out from government through UKRI or directly through government departments, but also through um, pharmaceutical companies, through other philanthropic organisations. And they will ask for a specific piece of work that is then going to inform their thinking or their decision making on a particular topic. So one of the nice things is that it's pretty broad because you're working on things that you can win money for. Uh, and someone is paying you to do it but at the same time you don't always get to follow your dream or the specific research area that you would really like to so I worked on um, how you set up different organizations like the governance behind UKRI or the HRA when it was set up 10 years ago um, also different assessment systems so working back to my work at um, British Library, did the evaluation of the REF um, and also different systems. So I got to travel to Hong Kong and look at their system and compare it. Lots of work on higher education. So the TEF, for example. Um, but as I said, it's all related to the sorts of things that you can sell and win. So as well as the sort of core there of, you know, where my heart really is. I've also done work on smart cities, um, work on international development, uh, how you fund science, for example, in Africa, how you uh, stimulate collaborations there from evaluations of schemes uh, either the NIHR or others are putting towards and also different parts of healthcare, so specific questions but on different disease areas. And then probably some of those that are most random as it is here you know work on the impact of ammonia emissions on biodiversity and the interaction between the natural environment and mental health outcomes so the range is is really broad and with all projects there's something interesting whether it's the methodology whether it's the outcomes whether it's just the people that you're working with but there's such a breadth but in each one what you hope is that because you're that close to the policy makers because they're the ones commissioning the research won't get left on the shelf it will have you know legs and, and actions on it and you know sometimes that does happen and you get to see how you've informed things how things are changing as a result of of what your work found but it still is one step away from that um from that policy making and so Earlier this year, I decided to move to the Association for Medical Research Charities, uh, and I'm their Director of Policy and Public Affairs. And 
that move was about getting closer to the policy makers and to informing that. And what I really hope is that the evidence background that I come at it with will enable me to get them to make the right decisions by being able to present the in, the information in a compelling way. So uh, just a little bit of background in case you don't know about the Association for Medical Research Charities. They're a membership body of uh, research charities in the UK. We've got 151 members from household names such as Welcome, uh, Where Lillian's based, uh, British Heart Foundation, Cancer Research, uh, right down to really small charities that work on rare diseases or niche conditions um, and often a, you know one person uh, working on on the charity side and all of our charities offer both well most of our charities offer both the service to their own community and also the research arm of it um, and they differ in the amount that they spend on each both in time and in and in financial um, and what we do is we aim to sort of convene advocate and influence on their behalf um, we provide training we carry out an audit and when they're members of us it also allows them to have access to certain schemes um, because the peer review that they do for their research is sufficiently robust so what do we do in the policy side well i'm responsible for the team that oversees that and we split it into sort of research funding where we're supporting our members as to how do they navigate the landscape of being one of the funders in a diverse ecosystem within the UK. Um, we're also doing a lot of work on research culture and how to improve uh, equity, diversity and inclusion uh, in both the research that is funded in the organisations themselves, but also in the people that they fund and how they can influence the university environment in which they fund. Um, clinical research, because obviously that's how we will end up with some of the main patient benefits. A lot of things on data and digital where charities are often the front runners uh, in terms of registries, for example. And also sort of nagging thing at the back of my mind, of course, is the impact of Brexit as well as the impact of the pandemic. So what sort of things do we do? Well, I think I was thinking this through and, you know, there's no average day from that perspective. And one thing I should say is that your day can be completely derailed by somebody phoning with an urgent query. I mean, one of the examples today is there's a debate next week on the health and care bill in the Lords. So questions from Lords researchers on, you know, how does research fit into this bill? What can we do? Being able to brief those, you know, can take up time that you just weren't expecting this morning when I sat down at my desk. Um, but we do a lot of work to raise the profiles of charities. And, you know, I, I don't know what you know about the research charities, but within the medical space, last year they funded £1.7 billion of, of research. This is 49% of all medical research conducted in the UK. And so that is as much as MRC and NIHR put together. And so it's really important that they have that voice and that they're taken seriously as one of the players in the in the ecosystem. So we explain the breadth of things that they produce. And if you look at this slide, some of you might recognize on the right, some of the research fish categories, which are used to, to, um, to describe different types of impacts and um, able to amalgamate up what our members have. Um, and you know to try and also raise the profile of for example on the left hand side uh, that's a video that we did on twitter around the impact of the pandemic on medical research charities um some of the other things we do are lots of consultation responses so when the government put out a consultation to um, look at changes to a specific area we will respond um, i think we've done about 12 or 13 this year um, and you've got some of the ones from earlier this year, um, including the response to the inquiry on equity and STEM workforce, for which they've recently announced there's going to be another one. So we're looking at how do we put things in for that as well. And it's about raising the profile, raising the members points, and also understanding what's going to create a better system. Because at the end of the day, what we need to do is to work out how to improve the environment in which 
science is happening to enable patient benefit to benefit those charities and at the bottom here we've got informing strategy um, this is the future of the clinical research delivery so we spend a lot of time working with government on different visions and strategies that they're going to release um, i guess having more parties uh, involved in it means there may be less criticism but hopefully from our perspective it also means that there will be uh, more applicability to patients and the charity voice being heard in them so finally just to give you uh, one example where some of these things come together as I mentioned earlier, the COVID pandemic has really impacted on the medical research charities um, because of the loss of fundraising income. Uh, they estimate that their income has gone down by, uh, well, their research spend has gone down by 290 million. That's an actual figure, not an estimate in the last year. So that's a third of all fundraising uh, charities. And so to when, at the beginning of the pandemic when this was realized amrc really championed the sector and supported um the whole ecosystem so you know you can see on here we've got a letter somewhere i'm sure from um the pharmaceutical companies uh, and supporting it because there's a real understanding in the life sciences ecosystem that damaging one part of the system whether it's the charity um finances or the overseas development aid or Horizon Europe funding will damage everybody. So there's a lot of cross organization collaboration that goes into it. Um, we've done different letters, wrote to the prime minister, um, scheduled debates, and each one of those requires sort of coordination on our side to ensure we get the right people saying the right things at the right time. So most recently we had um, a series of, of um, CEOs from our charity speaking to different um, MPs and they were asking, well, what do you still need? Well, as a result of this campaign, the charities managed to secure 20 million pounds of funding. We were asking for 310 million, so it is much lower than is needed, but we have been able to create a sort of early career researcher uh, scheme that is being managed currently by MRC and charities can apply to have their funding for a single year for some of their researchers um, covered and our hope is that this will allow some of the charities to recover a little bit and also to continue to fund because one of the greatest risks is the loss of talent from the pipeline and we all know that once we lose the scientists they're not coming back so I think overall, hopefully this has given you a little bit of flavour of some of the things around policy that we're working on. But I would say a lot of it is around speaking to people, understanding their perspectives, understanding how your agenda can align with theirs, and also making those relationships so that together we can call for what's going to create the best environment for science to thrive. And I'll stop sharing my slides. That was brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina. That was excellent. So we'll move on to Lillian next and we'll have questions at the end. But if you think of questions for any of the three speakers, you feel free to put them in the chat box as we're going along. So I'd like to now introduce Dr. Lillian Hunt from EDIS. Thanks, Thanks Caroline. Uh, let me just share my screen. Um, yeah, brilliant. So um, yeah, as Caroline mentioned, so I'm Dr. Lillian Hunt. I um, work at EDIS or Wellcome Trust, both are, both are absolutely valid because EDIS is actually housed within Wellcome Trust. Um, EDIS is an acronym standing for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion in Science and Health. It's a coalition of organisations and I'll get onto a bit about that later on. Um, but I kind of wanted to start this, I guess, aspect of how did I get into policy with a sort of a question of am I in a career in policy and this is definitely something that I sort of had to reflect on a little bit and felt a little bit imposter syndrome being on this panel. Um, my job title is Edith Lead, it doesn't have policy in the name, I sit within the culture equity diversity and inclusion team that doesn't have policy in the name, we're in the people team that doesn't have policy in the name and here I am with two fantastic policy uh, career people and um, but the reality is a career in policy, I think, is often framed as that, as in get yourself a role that says policy in it. But it turns out that actually science policy 
um, is much broader than that in scope. And there are so many different ways to get involved in policy within the science and research sphere um, that wouldn't necessarily you wouldn't necessarily think about. Um, and I think this is really important because I think when I was finishing up my PhD, I, I did think, oh, science policy sounds like something I want to do without a real understanding of what it was, other than the fact that these jobs existed that said science policy. Um, so trying to figure out what my own path was, to sort of get involved in those sort of activities, I, I think was really important for me. Um, the reality is, you know, there's a fantastic Wikipedia article about what science policy is. It's probably explained it best than anyone else has ever done personally to me, um, but really thinking about sort of the allocation of resources, the way science is done and things like that, as with the goal of best serving the public interest. And that's public interest, patient interest, that's, you know, the whole of society. And that's, that speaks to me a lot. You know, the, the topics can include funding of science, the careers of scientists, um, you've got the translation of scientific discoveries into sort of technological innovation. Um, you've got you know product development, you've got economic growth, economic development is so broad ranging that actually getting into a science policy role is great if you want to start sort of looking at that broad range. But if you're able to find a different way in, normally through sort of carving out a different niche or following a particular interest, there is still plenty of science policy work out there to be done. So imposter syndrome over, how did I actually get to here? So I did my um, undergrad degree in molecular genetics at King's College London. I grew up in a sort of country Buckinghamshire, so I moved to London as soon as I could, and I've stayed here ever since. Um, I'm gonna, I put on there that I was on the Women's Rugby Committee because I think that was my first foray into sort of figuring out a path outside of science without realising what I was doing. Um, I played it as a sport, but I think it was the committee and the organising aspect and the sort of what we were doing with the student union and things like that that was also quite exciting there. I did my PhD in genetics it was a well originally it was the national institute for medical research um which was in mill hill which then merged into the francis crick institute as one of the legacy sites um ucl was the awarding body for my degree i have to say that even though i never really went there it was all at the francis crick institute um I did that in genetics and what when we moved from the national institute of medical research into the francis crick institute that was when myself and one of my friends sandik from one of the other legacy sites um, so joined together to create the LGBTQ plus network there, the Proud Crick Network, it's called. Um, understanding that ne neither of us had seen LGBTQ role models in science at that point, and I, for one, was definitely nervous about coming out to my supervisor in the sort of early weeks of my PhD, not knowing if it was okay to be a queer scientist or if scientists were queer or anything like that. Turns out it was fine, um, and it was all sort of just a, as a result of not seeing anyone prior to that. So we made a, a real conscious effort to make sure that other students coming in, other postdocs coming in, knew that there was a network, a supportive network that existed, and that the, the institute itself was a safe space to be. Um, and it was through that, I guess, that I want to say that my career really spiralled out of control, um, because that's if you look at my sort of path, that's the first real sort of step into equality work, I guess, really, and sort of social justice work within science itself. Um, I was asked to be a student representative on the Francis Crick Institute's Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. And that was really also the first time I started seeing things that were headed with the word policy as well. And that was internal institute policies, uh, maybe external facing policy about something. And we were often asked to read over these things and contribute our views and say what we thought the Crick, the Institute's position statement should be on these things, what its future policy should be, mostly around sort of recruitment, retention, but also sometimes actually about things around how we were interacting with um, government policy, for example, you know, whether or not we were sort of accepting or wanted to push back on something that someone in government had said about research itself. So throughout that sort of last couple of state years of my phd i really sort of got more involved in stuff outside of the lab um i did more volunteering work i did more public speaking work i did some science communications writing work and really sort of spread my sort of perspective of what i was doing and that was probably because quite soon i want to say into my phd i knew that i wanted to do my phd i loved the research i was doing and that project was fantastic for me but I also knew that I never wanted to be head of a lab. I didn't want to be a PI. I didn't want to be a you know principal investigator. I didn't want to be a professor. That path just didn't didn't it didn't excite me, and it wasn't something that I wanted to do. I wanted to be involved in science. I wanted to be involved in research, um, but I didn't want to be 
in the wet lab doing all of that work. I also did dry lab, did half bioinformatics, half wet lab work, and I didn't want to just do bioinformatics either. But what I found in my PhD was a realization that the way we were doing research didn't feel quite right in a lot of spaces. And that was sort of the culture aspect of it, the competitive aspect of it, some elements of reproducibility, and also the applicability and the benefit. I really could start seeing how health inequity was being driven by the way that we were doing research. My PhD was in genetics and I was trying to do some population genetics at one point. And actually at that time with thousand genomes, there were no control populations from the same other cohort background as the group that I was working with. And it was a vast sort of dearth of data, I guess, in the whole of Southeast Asia at that point when it came to genomics data. And it really got me thinking, you know, if we're not doing research in an equitable way right now, if we're not thinking about all of the different patients that could be involved in genomics research and all of the different groups and all of the different people that could benefit from this, if they're not involved in research from the very beginning, then they're not going to get the benefits of it in the, in the long term. Um, and it was much broader than genetics, you know, that you start realizing these things, you start realizing who is and who isn't involved in sort of cancer research and who is and isn't involved in, you know, diabetes research and, you know, different groups are all experiencing these, whether that's age, whether that's gender, sex, sexual orientation, ethnicity, culture, there are lots of different groups that are experiencing health in different ways. And so much of it can be traced back to who and how we're researching. So that really sparked a passion in me and going, you know, actually, this is something that I'm, I really do care about. And this is something that I think I can do something in, or at least I want to. Um, it was in that last year of my PhD as well that I um, helped draw together um, the Francis Crick Institute, Wellcome Trust and GlaxoSmithKline, who all had separately thought equality, diversity and inclusion, you know, improving the culture of research is important but they hadn't worked together before. So in my final year, I spent a lot of time bringing those three organizations together to say, okay, let's work together on this. Let's take a funder, a research institute and a pharmaceutical company and see what, what, what silos we can break down when it comes to this sort of work in the research culture sphere. So in 2017, we ran the first EDIS as it was then called, um, as it then named, it's still called that today, um, EDIS Symposium, and to really talk about those issues and to really sort of bring them to light and make sure that people are on the same page. Now, it turns out that that was a really great success and really enjoyable to do. Touched on a lot of topics that I was interested in personally and professionally. And I was asked to then um, project manage that and sort of see, see what we could grow out of it. There were lots of other organizations at the time who were going, this is great. And we're actually speaking to each other about these equalities issues in research. And we haven't before, even though we've been trying to do this work on our own or we've been trying to get this through. So we brought, spent about a year kind of figuring figuring out what it could look like and sort of what its aims should be and whether there was space for it in the sector and launched it to the rest of the sector in 2018. That's when, um, at that point, 10 other organisations got involved, um, the Association of Medical Research Charities being one of them. And then um, it was really great to go, OK, brilliant. Now we've got this bigger coalition. We're breaking down these silos. We're leaving egos at the door and we're going, what is good for science and what is good for research and what is good for the public? And that really was sort of a, is sort of the marker of how EDIS works as a coalition. Um, so in 2020, I was sort of absorbed into Welcome to make sure that I stayed and to make sure that EDIS kept going, um, which is great because I now have some nice job security. But like I said, I'm not in a policy team. I'm not in a team that is specifically around health policy or anything like that. I'm in the culture, equity, diversity, inclusion team. Um, and that's really because so much of the work that we're doing is trying to understand how to improve the culture that research is happening in. Now, what I have managed to do is shoehorn into the uh, culture, equity, diversity, and inclusion team at Welcome Strategy around inclusive research, design, and practice. So that piece that I really picked up in the end of my PhD about how we do research, who's who's included in terms of, sort of patients that are included, who's in included in terms of co-production, and sort of you know what data is collected and analysed. That's now embedded in their culture, equity, diversity, and inclusion strategy alongside who's being funded and alongside who is on their staff as well. So we've been able to sort of merge all of that together there. And we will say EDIS has the same sort of perspective, you know, who's doing research, who's being researched and who benefits from research is all very interlinking. And that systems approach is so important. So that's why we got this sort of broad range of, okay, policy, you know, <laughs> it covers all of that. It covers the structure and the foundations that we're working in. Um, 
and just so you've got sort of an idea of, of how big EDIS is now, we're, at, we're up to 21 members and we really do span such a vast variety of types of organisations. And I get to work with all of these organisations individually and collectively on so many different problems, so many different statements, so many different consultation responses. You know, we get to draw in the experiences and the ideas of all of these groups and figure out, OK, what is really good for research and what's good, for, what needs to change for science to be beneficial for everyone? Um, and so that's it's kind of where I've developed this and that's I guess the imposter syndrome which is actually at not at any point of this as my job title said policy um but how is this actually policy well that's because I've actually done a lot of policy work over the last few years um and specific things that are labeled as policies but also things that are definitely part of policy work that's really important so considering sort of the equality diversity and inclusion work I've developed different strategies for different organizations position statements and supported them with action plans all of that comes in sort of EDI policy work. I've helped develop inclusive name change policies for the publishing sector. So this is journals um, and research journals who are publishing in all sorts of sciences now, actually. And they didn't have a way for you to sort of change your name after publication that was um, both allowed for privacy, um, but also was done sort of systematically in a sort of inclusive manner. And this is supportive of people who have maybe changed their name as a result of transition, as a result of religious changes, as a result of marriage, as a result of divorce. And so be able to work on a really good policy there. And that's now thousands of journals have that in place. And, you know, I remember when I published there was a sort of a, a conversation of you know if you get married in future will you keep your name in your journals and in your publications that sort of question doesn't actually have to exist anymore because you can actually change your name post publication in so many journals um other things that we've included sort of policies around sort of how to ask diversity inclusion questions um for data collection and that's applicable for both organizations as employees as employers but also in terms of the research we're doing um as uh, katrina mentioned before the all-party parliamentary group on diversity and inclusion in stem written responses to their inquiries give pro providing evidence um, the department for health and social care women's health strategy consultation they actually contacted me and edis to ask for our input on that and sort of provide policy statements for that and to provide information for their policy statements but also helped coordinate the edis members themselves with their own statements as well to make sure that as a collective we were on the same page we were saying the same things and we we're asking the same things of um, the Department for Health and Social Care. And that was really fantastic because actually those, those responses were brilliant in terms of the progress that I saw around equality, diversity, inclusion, language, around the language around social justice and things like that. And it really did, it was quite a proud moment seeing AMRC and Academy of Medical Sciences, uh, you know, what their responses were, British Pharmacological Society as well, and really seeing them tee up together, you know, those responses and make a big impact. Because when I had that call with DHSC, you know, they were like, well, we've, we're really hearing this message. And I'm like, yes, perfect, because that's what we wanted to happen. Um, we've got sort of internally within Welcome as well, our own policies on trans inclusion, on our way that we run our conferences. Even I even got to digest the entire Public Health England COVID-19 uh, inequalities report to help inform Welcome in terms of its own COVID-19 response, especially for its building reopening, but also how we're interacting with staff. So didn't expect to be doing that, but that's something that got put on, put on my plate as well, knowing that I could digest big amounts of, sort of health research information and turn it into applicable stuff around decision making and sort of position statements that Welcome might want to take. And then I've also been able to actively research as well, which I think is phenomenal. Um, so I've done a huge piece of work with Professor Londa Schiebinger out in Stanford, um, who runs Gendered Innovations, which is a, um, an EU-US sort of funded directive around um, gender inclusion in research content itself. And we've done this global study to look at global um, public funders policies on how they uh, incorporate sex, gender or diversity analysis into the research they fund as well, with the idea of bringing in that learning back into the UK, who are quite far behind compared to some of our sort of peers in that space. So, you know, this is a huge, vast array of stuff. And yet before this sort of invitation, I don't know if I would have said that I was working in policy, but um, it's been nice to sort of reflect and go, actually, yes, I am in, in various ways, which is quite exciting because it is, it is something that I kind of had that nugget of information of going, this sounds like something you'd be interested in. But I think similarly to what we were saying at the beginning, you know, this information isn't freely available often as in this is a career path and there are many ways into it and many ways to work in this space. So hopefully I've given you sort of a, 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 bit, a bit of a different path into policy, I guess, and sort of, a, and sort of carving out your own niche based on interests and based on sort of where, where your passions lie. But 
finding those spaces and just getting involved in the, with the right organizations is definitely key to that i'll stop rambling now because i'm definitely a bit over time but thank you so that's fantastic <laughs> thank you so we'll move on to our third speaker now jade hall from, from the rsb so um if you want to share your screen jade and um, brilliant thank you Brilliant, thank you. So I'm hoping to help everyone answer the question of is science policy for me? And over the next couple of minutes, I'm hoping to give you an understanding of who I am, what in the world is science policy, and also where you can go to find out more about science policy. So I just want to touch on a little bit about my motivation and me and what first got me into the life sciences. Ever since I was a kid, I was absolutely obsessed by cartoons. And there was this one cartoon called Kim Possible. Kim Possible was a really cool action hero and she had her best friend and they went on loads of adventures. But the real pulling point for me with this cartoon was this character called Rufus. And Rufus was bright pink, had beady eyes, massive incisors, claws. And I always thought Rufus was a figment of the cartoon creator's imagination. But then upon a trip to London Zoo, I found out that Rufus was actually real and Rufus was a naked mole rat. And I always credit the naked mole rat for my love of biology and my love of science, because to this day, I still feel like the naked mole rat is one of the most biologically complex organisms ever. But then in terms of having my love of animals, and I was always obsessed by nature documentaries too, I found that this really did propel me into thinking about biology as an undergraduate degree. At the time, the career options with biology were really broad. So I thought it was best if I carried out an industrial placement I enjoyed working in a lab. I enjoyed exploring what it was like to get experience working in the biotech industry. It was also great being paid. But then I found at the end of my undergraduate degree, when you looked at all of my grades, my highest graded modules were those that were either linked to animal or plant science. So this really did propel me to think about specialising for my master's. And I ended up going for a master's in ecology and evolution. And I could really immerse myself um, into the nature and also into the different ecosystems which you can see with that photo so that's where I actually fell in but then after my master's this is where my story becomes a bit tricky I tried to go for a PhD and I just found it really tricky at the time so I thought it'd be best to take some time out and work in a lab I thought it'd be good to then explore what it was like being in academia I was then helping other PhD students collect their data and at the time, my manager became my mentor and then became my then supervisor. And I did end up getting that PhD. I just want to tell you a little bit about the PhD that I carried out. At the time, it was a little bit unusual. It was a doctoral training program, so it was known as a DTP. And what was exciting about this DTP is that you were able to spend your first year working on different projects. This allows you to get a feel for the project, get a feel for the lab that you would be in for the next three to four years. My first project was looking at mosquito attraction. You could tell I was very attracted to the mosquitoes. But then my second project ended up being my final PhD, and that was looking at quantitative analysis of movement as an indicator of bird emotion and personality. But then the other exciting thing about a DTP is the internship. So you had to take three months out of your PhD. And at the time, I was absolutely panicked to do so. But it really was a fantastic learning experience because it allowed me to immerse myself out of academia and think about other career options. So I was working as a project development officer uh, for a conservation organization. And I just really want to give you a reality about my career. If you ask any of my friends and family, they would say I'm a planner. If I could plan every second of my life, I would. And I often thought at the start of my academic career, it looked like this, whereas in reality, it looked like this. So it was very similar to what Lillian and Katrina were saying, is that at the end of my PhD, I just felt like it wasn't for me. And I honestly felt like I was going through a breakup with academia. I felt like I had invested so much time and energy and I wasn't really aware of what else was out there for me. But then I ended up doing a really fantastic exercise. And I just want to talk about the power of transferable skills. I wasn't leaving academia. I was bringing all those skills along with me. And yet again, it's not just from academia, it's thinking about the range of other industries and disciplines and areas that I've worked on, in addition to my lived experiences that are all really added to make me me. 
So also at the end of my PhD, I started going to careers talks exactly like this one. And at one of the careers talks was Dr. Laura Marshall, who was head of science policy. And I just really did think about, and I really did hear about all the incredible ways that a lot of my skill sets would actually match that of policy. So I now currently work for the RSB. And as you can see, those are four key areas that we work on. So RSB's vision is to have a world that really understands the true value of biology and how it can contribute to improving life for all. Whereas our mission is to try and unify the voice of biology. So we're a charity and we're a member organization. We have over 17,000 individual members, and that ranges from anyone who has a general interest in biology, to people that work in academia or industry, to students or teachers. Whereas we also have over 80 different member organizations, which are similar life science organizations like us. And I specialize in the policy element with RSB. So if you looked me up on the website, this is exactly what you would see. I am responsible for helping RSB develop a range of policy activities. And then I normally like to say that they're linked to those with the, that are really linked to the individual scientists. So that's anything from topics, including research funding to research integrity, to publication policy, and also diversity inclusion work. But then what I really think it can break down to is that I'm a connector, I'm a vessel, and I'm a facilitator. It really is about bringing the right people in the room and Katrina and Lenny did really fantastic jobs about explaining policy, but I just want to bring in some definitions. So policy seeks to obtain an outcome that wouldn't normally happen. It can be a plan, a course of action, a framework, a set of rules. And really, it's all thinking about how do you influence a desired outcome? Policies are often adopted by the government or different businesses, whereas policy makers are the people that are responsible for formulating or amending those policies. And when we think about science policy in particular, often at RSB we use two different terms. That's either science for policy or policy for science. And if we break it down, science for policy is the use of scientific evidence in public policy decision making. A couple of key examples can be the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's thinking about public health and how data has really helped decision making. We have the recent COP26 climate change conference. And yet again, climate models have really helped to think about strategies and outcomes to move forward. Whereas we now move on to policy for science, which is the area that I tend to work on, we're really thinking about policy decisions that impact the development of science and innovation. So I went from academia where I was collecting the data and now I like to think that I help with the policy, the policies that are about supporting scientists and those who are collecting the data. And if we think about science funding, we're thinking about are there policies in place to make sure that the UK is bringing enough money in to make sure that we're a place where we can really have research and innovation and allow it to thrive. If we think about Brexit, do we have immigration policies in place to make sure that the UK is an attractive place to bring in talent? And of course, you've got equality, diversity and inclusion. We're highly aware of the Black Lives Matter movement and how that's really made several organisations focus on how they're supporting marginalised communities. So regardless of whether it's science for policy or policy for science, it's all about asking the right questions. It's thinking about, is your topic relevant? Are you collecting the right type of evidence to get your point across? Who is your audience? If you're working on policies for the government versus working on policies for a smaller organization, thinking about who you're talking to can really differ. It's also thinking about what's your desired outcome and also who do you engage? My favorite thing about policy is it's all about the narrative. It's all about storytelling. And yet again, there are a range of methods that you can use to communicate policy. I used to think it was all about writing, but in my policy work, it can be anything from organizing events, answering government consultations, thinking about topical media statements or newsletters or briefing notes or really supporting different committees and groups to come together. And I just want to take you through a couple of key outputs that I work on throughout my day to day tasks. The first thing is really answering government consultations. So we've all touched on the APPG response but in terms of the actual steps that I've taken to help RSB answer that consultation. You're watching out for the announcements. You're then collecting the evidence through a range of different 
avenues that's either looking at articles or reports or even organizing roundtables to bring people together you're then drafting your statement you're redrafting your statement you're most probably redrafting your statement again and then you're circulating it to interested parties yet again for that back and forth to try and receive more comment on it then you go through your sign off and submission and one of my favorite part about consultation responses is really thinking about if any of your recommendations have been taken on the other key output i tend to work on in my job is assisting with events so rsb have an absolutely amazing events team and the policy team often help develop the program so you have a range of different events that rsb tend to handle one is parliamentary events and that voice of the future is bringing together young scientists and engineers to quiz political figures and it's thinking about helping develop different questions to ask whereas if you think about policy lates that's another fantastic element where we get to bring experts together on a range of different topics to answer different questions from the public. And finally, one of my favourite elements about working in policy is really thinking about the committee and individual support. A part of my role is to help RSB embed equality, diversity, inclusion strategies throughout our policies and practices. And I do this by supporting two main groups. One is the diversity inclusion working group and the other is the diversity inclusion network. We come together quarterly. We often have really fantastic conversations about how we can change the sector. But then what I also really love is the individual level. With my role in policy, I get to work with different staff members, our board of trustees and member organizations. And also what's another fantastic thing is that I get to be sent to external meetings such as EDIS representing RSB2. So from the comfort of your home now, I just want to leave you with two take home great outputs in which you can find out more about science policy. The first one is the RSB Science Policy Newsletter. So this is a weekly roundup of policy headlines and stories, it goes out every Friday. Whereas the second one is the Policy Resource Library. And this is a fantastic resource because it's a repository of over 800 documents that are linked to either RSB or our member organizations. There are several consultation responses. So it's a really great way to get a feel of a couple of key outputs. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Jade. That was absolutely fantastic. So thank you all three speakers for fantastic talks.